Therefore, the tribute being completed, it is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, this is about trust, and my question is for the Premier. The people of Ontario put their trust in this government and in this Premier. The Premier put her trust in Pat Sabera, her former Deputy Chief of Staff. This staffer breaks the trust by allegedly bribing Andrew Olivier, promising him a government job in exchange for a political favour that benefited the Ontario Liberal Party. Instead of distancing herself from the accused, the Premier rewards her, entrusting Pat Sabera with leading her next campaign. Mr. Speaker, why does the Premier continue to place her trust in Pat Sabera? Is it because Pat Sabera does exactly what the Premier asked? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, there, is, uh, there has been an investigation, uh, and I know the uh, Leader of the Opposition knows that at every stage of the uh, investigation we've cooperated fully and we will continue to do so. Um, I said in 2015 if uh, any charges were laid as a result of the investigation, then Patricia Sobera would step aside, and uh, this will happen if charges are laid, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Media are reporting that Pat Sabera, the CEO of the Ontario Liberal Party, will be charged with bribery from her time as the Premier's Deputy Chief of Staff. She is accused of bribing Andrew Olivier to step aside as a contestant in the Sudbury by-election. Mr. Speaker, did the Premier order the current CEO of the Ontario Liberal Party to allegedly bribe Andrew Olivier during the Sudbury by-election, yes or no? Uh, I, I am going to be listening very intently to the questions and the answers. I'm going to say two things. First of all, it's very difficult for me to ask a side to keep quiet if I'm getting responses while the question is being put. I'm asking that we uh, treat this with a sensitivity. I am going to listen carefully. If I get a sense that the, the, the member is making an accusation of a betting that is not appropriate, and I, would, uh, I will say so. It's dangerously close to that now. I will ask, allow the question to be put, but I'm listening carefully to ensure that that does not happen. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I will say again, uh, in 2015, uh, I said that uh, if any charges were laid as a result of the investigation, then Patricia Sorbera would step aside. Um, if charges are laid, Mr. Speaker, that will happen. Um, and I believe, Mr. Speaker, it to be true that if charges are laid, we all have a collective responsibility to uh, let the matter be handled by a court of law under the presumption of innocence. That is, uh, that's the reality that we're confronting, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplement. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. I I'm not getting uh, an answer to this question. Pat Sabera, now the CEO of the Ontario Liberal Party, told Andrew Olivier Quote, you've been directly asked by the leader and the premier to make a decision to step aside. End quote. Pat Severa told him, quote, you're the third person I've ever heard the premier ask this of. End quote. Pat Severa has now been charged, according to the media, with bribery. So, Mr. Speaker, who ordered the CEO of the Ontario Liberal Party, Pat Severa, to allegedly offer Andrew Olivier a bribe? I would appreciate an answer to a very straightforward question. Mr. Speaker, there has been an investigation that has occurred outside of this House, as it should, Mr. Speaker. Yep. There, if, there are charge, if there are charges laid, this matter will be handled in a court of law, Mr. Speaker. It's our responsibility to, under the presumption of, uh, of innocence, Mr. Speaker, to allow that matter to be dealt with in a court of law. I said in 2015 that if charges were laid, then Patricia Sabera would step aside. If charges are laid, that will happen, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Yeah. New question, Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. The Premier has said she, and I quote, had a conversation with Andrew Olivier, end quote, and that the Premier's closest political confidant, Pat Sabera, had a conversation the next day. This isn't about Pat Sabera stepping aside if charged. That should be a given. My question, and I'll be very clear, crystal clear again, Mr. Speaker. Who ordered Pat Severa to allegedly offer Andrew Olivier a bribe? The House deserves an answer. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Premier. John Premier, uh, the Premier uh, <coughs> has been uh, has been open with the legislature, uh, the media, and the public uh, about the allegations related to the Sudbury by-election. As the Premier uh, said, and she is absolutely right, Speaker, if the charges are laid, it will become our shared responsibility to allow those charges to be dealt with in the court of law, not in this house. Uh, speaker, we will continue to cooperate with the with the independent investigation. I also want to confirm, Speaker, that if, if any charges are laid, the matter will be handled by the Public Prosecution Service of Canada. Thank, Thank you. you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier, and let me say it speaks volumes that the Premier refuses to answer these very direct questions. Pat Severa said to Andrew Olivier that, quote, it's not a question of whether we know you want it. The Premier is asking you to agree to put that aside for now, end quote. Media are reporting that Pat Sabera will be charged with bribery as she tried to get Andrew Olivier to give up his democratic right to run for office. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, who Start the clock. Please finish. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, directly to the Premier, who ordered Pat Sabera to allegedly offer Andrew Olivier a bribe? And if the Premier refuses to answer, that says everything, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Speaker, I think it's, it's very clear and Ontarians totally understand that if there are any matters that are dealing with the court, uh, it has to be dealt. I'm trying to get a message to you that I want quiet. <clears throat> All legal, legal matters must be dealt in the court of law. This legislature is not such place. If any charges are laid, uh, laid they will be dealt with in uh, in the courts uh, by appropriate independent authorities. As I, as I mentioned uh, before, Speaker, and I'll restate that uh, if charges are laid, uh, the prosecution will be uh, conducted by the Pro Public Prosecution Service of Canada, which is independent of the Ministry of the Attorney General. Thank you. Thank you. Final supplement. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. Media reporting that Jerry Lougheed may also be charged with bribery alongside Pat Sabera, the CEO of the Ontario Liberal Party. During the investigation, it was revealed Mr. Lougheed Chief told Government Mr. Whip. Olivier, quote, I come to you on behalf of the Premier, end quote. Wow. Mr. Speaker, who ordered Jerry Lougheed and Pat Sabera to allegedly offer Andrew Olivier a bribe if the Premier did not simply say so, not to answer? Not to answer is hiding information from the House. I want an answer, Mr. Speaker. You say it, please. You say it, please. Thank you. Governor Speaker. Uh, speaker, if charges are laid, the matter will be dealt with in the court of law, uh, not in this legislature. That is the appropriate place. I do remind the members that there is rule in our standing orders dealing with sub judice where we are uh, uh, instructed not to engage or intervene in matters that may be before the courts. Uh, if charges are laid, the matters will be dealt with in the court. That's where it should be. It should be speaker, and we should respect that. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you uh, very much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. News broke this morning that the Premier's top aide, Patricia Sabara, and Sudbury power broker for the Liberal Party, Jerry Lougheed, will be charged later today under the Elections Act by the OPP. Charges stem from the alleged bribery of former Liberal candidate Andrew Olivier during last year's by-election, actually, uh, for the riding of Sudbury. Can the Premier confirm, in light of these pending charges, that she will ask Ms. Sorbera to step down as her campaign chair until all charges have been dealt with in their entirety? 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I have, uh, I have, I believe, done that uh, a number of times already in the House today. I said that in 2015, I said in 2015 that if any charges were laid as a result of the investigation that has been ongoing, then Patricia Sabora, of course, would uh, would step aside. And this will happen if charges are laid, Mr. Speaker. Right. Supplementary. Speaker, Speaker, the people of Ontario should be able to trust their government. Today, Ms. Sorbera will be facing charges that allege she used her position in the Premier's office to offer a bribe to a candidate to induce him not to run for office. Will the Premier confirm that Ms. Sorbera will pay no role in either the Premier's government or her election campaign until all charges have been completely dealt with? So I will say again, Mr. Speaker, um, at every stage we have cooperated fully uh, with the investigation that was ongoing. We'll continue to do so. Uh, Mr. Speaker, if, uh, if any charges are laid, then uh, Patricia Sorbera will step aside, as I, uh, I said would happen in 2015. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, I really haven't got quite the specific response I'm looking for in terms of whether or not Ms. Cerbera will be asked to step aside completely from her role, any role whatsoever, in the government or the election campaign. That was the question. The Premier is not answering it. It's been clear for some time that something happened in the Sudbury by-election by speaker that may very well have broken the law. The Premier choose, chose to deal with that not by asking the people uh, at the time that were involved to step aside until the issue was resolved, but instead by promoting the people involved to run not just a by-election, but most recently an entire provincial election campaign. Will the Premier admit today that it's not just about protecting but pr promoting Pat Sabera? That was the wrong thing to do, Speaker. Not just protecting her, but promoting her. And that the people of Ontario deserve better leadership and better accountability than what this Premier has offered. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, um, as the uh, Attorney General has said, there is a, there is, if there are charges laid, there will be a court uh, process, Mr. Speaker. This, this matter will be dealt with in the court. And, Mr. Speaker, I have answered many, many questions on this issue, on the substance of this issue, both in the legislature and in uh, in the public realm, Mr. Speaker. There has been an investigation. We have cooperated with that investigation. I said in 2015, uh, if there were charges laid, then Pat Cerbera would step aside from her roles. And if there are charges laid, that's what will happen, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the, pre for the Premier. Uh, did the Premier ask Ms. Cerbera or Mr. Lougheed to offer Andrew Olivier an alleged bribe to step aside to allow the Premier's candidate, in the, her preferred candidate in the Sudbury by election, an uncontested nomination? Want to comment, but I, I want to just say that um, to both the question from the leader of the questions from the leader of the opposition and the questions from the third leader of the third party, I have answered uh, many many questions. I am on the record. Uh, you can look at the responses that I have given both in this legislature and in the public realm, Mr. Sp in the um, outside of the House, Mr. Speaker. I've been very clear about uh, about those answers. And uh, at this point, Mr. Speaker, I said in 2015, if there uh, were charges laid, then Patricia Sorbara would step aside from her roles. That will happen if there are charges laid, Mr. Speaker. And if there are charges laid, then there will be a court process that we all have a responsibility Answer. to let unfold, Mr. Speaker. Stop. Stop, stop. Um, I, I, I'm going to offer the leader of the third party the same advice I offered the, the, the uh, leader of the opposition. Be very delicate and be very careful of not going over the line of making an assump uh, assumption, please. Uh, the last one was close. I will ask you not to do that, please. Uh, carry on. Speaker, I don't think anybody believes that Mr. Lougheed and Mr. Barra offered the alleged bribe to Andrew Olivier on their own. So can the Premier tell us, if it was not heard directly, who in her office or— I, I think uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to uh, ask the member to listen carefully. The, uh, even if you say it wasn't her, that implies that it was. So I'm going to ask the member to be very delicate about how she puts the question. Finish, please. This is a matter of public interest, and I have the right to ask the, the Liberal Premier. I, 
I, um, I, would ask, I would ask the member to simply, uh, in my request, it was to be cautious of how she put the question to ensure that it was parliamentary. That's all I'm asking. If the member chooses to continue to challenge that, I'll have to deal with it. I'm asking the member to be cautious of what she puts as a question in this House. There are rules that you need to follow. You were close. I mentioned it. Now I'm asking the member to put the question in a way that is parliamentary. Care. Thank you, Speaker. There are laws that should be followed in this province as well, I have to say. I guess my question simply is, who is the person that pulled the trigger when it came to asking for this alleged bribe to take place, Speaker? Attorney General. Thank you very much, Speaker. And again, uh, Speaker, the Premier, Premier has been very, uh, have been very open and, and transparent uh, to this legislature, to the media, and to the public uh, about the allegations that are related to the Sudbury by-election, Speaker. Um, you know whether or not, Speaker, law is broken. That is exactly what our courts are for. They're the one. A uh, judge is the person who makes that determination based on the evidence that's presented to them, not this legislature, Speaker. That's why, Speaker, I think we should, we should respect the sheer responsibility that we all have in terms of uh, respecting the presumptions of innocence um, and ensuring that a court uh, should be able to do uh, to their job uh, and it will be highly inappropriate, Speaker, uh, for these type of questions being asked in this House. Thank Answer. you. Answer. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, now that charges are going to be laid today, the Premier has a chance to do the right thing and make clear the Premier's role, if there was one, and the role that anyone else in her office may have played in Sudbury in December of 2014. Will she do that? Speaker, I think the Premier has been very clear uh, the steps uh, she plans to take if charges are, are laid, and I think uh, that stands uh, on the record, and she's been clear uh, going back to 2015. As I stated earlier, I think it's uh, highly inappropriate that uh, we pursue this line of questioning, Speaker, Garfield because this Dunlop. matter may be if charges are laid uh, before the court of law. Speaker, I will restate again that if charges are laid, the matter will be dealt independently uh, from the Ministry of the Attorney General uh, through the Public Prosecution Service of Canada. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member from Leeds Grand. Uh, my question is, uh, is to the Premier. Speaker, I warned the Premier yep. that if she stood with Pat Sorbera, she'd fall with her. Yep. Not only did this Premier stand with her, yep. she doubled down by arrogantly putting her in yep. charge of the Liberal re-election campaign while under OPP investigation. That's an appalling lack of judgment, even for this arrogant and out-of-touch government. <laughs> now we have a face having the Premier dragged further into this mess while the legal proceedings against her former deputy chief of staff and hand-picked re-election chair drag on. Speaker, will the Premier look beyond her own self-interest yep. and preserve the integrity of the office she was sworn to uphold by stepping aside until these legal matters are dealt with? <laughs> Thank you. Governor. Chief Government Whip, second time. Premier. No, Mr. Speaker, I will not do that. Um, I have been very clear uh, in all of my answers uh, earlier on the substance of this matter, Mr. Speaker. I've been very clear uh, in the cooperation that we have uh, undertaken with the investigation. I was very clear in 2015 that if there were charges laid, Mr. Speaker, that uh, Patricia Sorbera would step aside, and if charges are laid, that is what will happen. At that point, Mr. Speaker, this matter will be before the courts and under the presumption of innocence. I think it is all of our responsibility to let that court process unfold. Okay. Back to the Premier. That's not acceptable, Speaker. The Premier may have escaped charges herself, but her hands aren't clean. Far from it. These pending legal proceedings cast a dark shadow over her office and this entire government. This isn't a dispute. Uh, stop. Again, first of all, let me make it this, this clear. This line of questioning is appropriate in this House. How it's done is what we're talking about. So I don't want anyone to say this is not appropriate to ask. 
I want to make sure that the opposition has their opportunity to say so. I'm asking that you consider clearly the type and how you ask the question. The member was dangerously close to doing the same thing I admonished people before. It stops. I don't want that to done. You can do the question in the manner that is parliamentary. Please continue. Speaker, this isn't a dispute over policies or political philosophy. These unprecedented charges under the Elections Act reach right into the heart of the Premier's office and our democratic system. The Premier must know she was wrong then not to cut Pats are very loose, and now Ontarians rightfully demand and deserve accountability from her. If, they, if she stands with them, Speaker, she will fall with them, Speaker. Will the Premier Question. finally accept responsibility, admit she was wrong, and step aside until the legal system deals with Pats are very Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much. Uh, speaker, and, and again, uh, you know, if charges are laid, the matter will be dealt by the court of law. The premier remained focused on the job that the people of Ontario gave her. People, the premier, Speaker, is focused on building Ontario up. Premier, Mr. Speaker, is focused on building schools in our communities across this province. The premier, Mr. F uh, speaker, is focused on building hospitals across this province. Premier, uh, Mr. Speaker, is focused on creating jobs for Ontarians across this province. We're investing in infrastructure, we're building public transit. That is what Premier's mandate is, and she is working day and night, every single day, and we support her, and we'll continue to work with her in that endeavor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, yesterday the Minister for Tourism, Culture and Sport angrily denied that there were any plans to sell off Ontario Place. But the fact is, buried in the Premier's new 158-page omnibus bill, there's a clause that clearly allows for the sell-off of Ontario Place. The Minister even admitted to the media, and I quote, it's there. I don't know why it's there. It's there. Unquote. Yes, Speaker, it's there. Why is it there? Thank you. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, appreciate this opportunity to clarify. And I thank the member opposite for his question, Speaker. You know, we recognize on this side of the house that Toronto's waterfront should be for everyone to enjoy, and that's why I can state clearly that Ontario Place will remain in public hands and is not for sale. We are moving forward. We are moving forward, Speaker, with a plan to revitalize Ontario Place into a vibrant waterfront destination that, enga that engages Ontarians, young and old, and indeed all Canadians. Speaker, we made it clear during the 2014 election, and I'll make it clear again: developments like condos and casinos are not part of that plan. I look forward to more in the supplementary, but I'll just say this, Speaker, that these amendments to the legislation are going to make that revitalization process easier and more effective. And on this side of the house, Answer. we understand the. the opportunity to give businesses the, uh, the the tools that they need to speak or to have this conversation unlike the member opposite thank you mr speaker supplementary my 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 <laughs> speaker the existing law already allows ontario place to offer all the services all the public benefits that the minister has talked about but one thing the existing law doesn't allow is the sell off of ontario place the premier insisted over and over that she Minister wouldn't of Economic sell off Hydro growth. One, and then she did. That's right. Now she insists she won't sell off Ontario Place, even though she's tabled legislation to allow exactly that. Why should anyone trust the Premier when she says she's not going to sell off Ontario Place? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, Speaker, I always appreciate the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek come to order. The member from Renfrew and Epicene Pembroke come to order. Finish, Minister. 
Thank you, Speaker. You know, I always appreciate the opportunity to rise in this House and clarify statements by uh, those uh, members on the other side of the House, and this is a crystal clear opportunity. So let me make it perfectly clear in case the member opposite missed it the first time, Speaker. Ontario Place is not for sale, but I will tell you this. We are enormously excited about the opportunities inherent in revitalizing Ontario Place. Why, Mr. Speaker? Because we understand that it is a jewel to the people of this province, yes. and that is why in 2005, our Premier made it abundantly clear that it's going to remain that way, and I'm proud of that, Mr. Speaker, because it's going to see Ontario That's Place right. vital and open and accessible to all Ontarians, and that is the work that we are doing on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker. You see it, please? You see it, please? New question, member from Barry. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Our government is moving forward with an ambitious plan to combat climate change and help make Ontario an economic leader in the transitioning to a low-carbon economy. Through the Climate Change Action Plan, we will be transparently investing proceeds back into programs and initiatives that will reduce greenhouse gas emissions and assist households and businesses. The CCAP creates a foundation on which Ontario will develop the policies needed to provide more choices to families and businesses on ways to become more energy efficient and help fight climate change. We're taking action now to kickstart climate change actions by supporting initiatives such as energy retrofits and improving Russia. energy efficiency in social housing developments. Can the minister please inform the House of the details of that announcement? Thank you, Minister of the Environment. And Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I also want to give a shout out to the member from Barrie because Barrie and London, Ontario, are the two cities in our province pioneering net zero homes, where you can actually buy a net zero home. But you know, Mr. Speaker, for the rest of Ontario, the Premier and I and the Minister of Energy were uh, out in uh, uh, the MPP for Davenport riding. What? Visiting a home that's already benefiting from a $100 million investment we made with our energy partners that have reduced the cost of their home by 42 per cent. Mr. Speaker, 42 per cent reduction in their home heating and energy costs. That is unprecedented, Mr. Speaker. And over the next decade, we will, over the next five years, actually, we'll invest $8 billion in reducing energy costs and transportation costs <laughs> and fighting emissions. Answer. As a matter of fact, Mr. Speaker, this single action reduces GHGs in Ontario by 1.6 million Thank you. tons. Supplementary. Thank you to the minister for the answer. It's clear from the announcements like the home energy audits that Ontario will be well positioned to meet the challenge of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. In early October, the federal government announced their carbon pricing framework, and we were pleased that the framework allows provinces to choose cap and trade. Mr. Speaker, recently the leader of the opposition wrote to the federal government on his party's approach to carbon pricing. I know that the leader of the opposition was a big part of the Stephen Harper's government that did everything it could to obstruct meaningful discussions and actions in combating climate change. Could the minister please inform the House why our government's policy is better than the one being suggested by the leader of the opposition? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, first off, a cap and trade system drives out the lowest, most cost effective reductions on its own. It's extraordinarily effective. And, Mr. Speaker, we're not alone in this position. By March of next year, 60% of the world's economy will be covered by a cap and trade system. 60%, Mr. Speaker, and we're locked into a system that actually reduces emissions and promotes trade, Mr. Speaker. But the, the leader of the opposition's system of a revenue neutral carbon tax would mean that the price would have to be well over $50, four or five times what ours are, and would raise energy costs dramatically, Mr. Speaker. And it also misses that. The program that the Premier and I and, and the MPP for Davenport and the Minister of Energy announced the other day would be eviscerated because he wouldn't have the $8 billion. He would leave Ontario businesses, homeowners, our senior citizens and families bereft of the resources Thank to you. buy the electric vehicle. Thank you.
Thank you. New question. The member from Leeds Grenville. So, Speaker, my, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, the Premier can try to stand here this morning and claim she didn't know anything about what her deputy chief of staff and local operative in Sudbury were up to, but nobody's buying it. On something this important, she had to know. In fact, she boasted in a Toronto Star article in September that nothing happens in her office without her knowledge. Yep, we heard that. The Premier told the Star, and I quote, when there's a major change in our office or when there's a policy decision, I know about that decision and I authorize it or not. Yeah. I know and I authorize. Her words. So, Speaker, when did the Premier know about and when did she authorize the offer made to Andrew Olivier? Again, uh, th that was extremely close, and because it, it, making an accusation to an individual member under the circumstances I've described previously, I will tell the member that if that comes close to being done again, I will pass the question and provide the, minister, the, the Premier with an option not to answer. I'm asking for your cooperation on how you put the question, and I would ask the member from Lanark to pay attention while I'm speaking. Premier. General. Thank you very much, Speaker. And pre Speaker, again, the Premier has been very open to the public, uh, to this legislature, and to the media on, uh, uh, on uh, uh, the allegations as they relate to Sudbury by elections. Speaker, the Premier is not going to answer questions that should be dealt with in a, in a court of law. This is not that such place. That's why there's a rule that exists in this in this legislature uh, that deals with when there are matters that may be under investigation or before courts that they not be dealt with um, in, uh, in in the legislature. So the, the member opposite can spend as much of his time asking as many questions as possible. The premier will remain focused on her job, and that is to build Ontario up, and that is to make sure that everyday lives of Ontarians is getting better and better every single day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Premier. There's no running from this for the yeah. Premier. Yeah. This unprecedented scandal and the Elections Act charges are directly connected to the Premier's office. Yeah. Right now, Speaker, there are two by-elections underway in Ontario. With the scandalous actions in Sudbury, the subject of new charges today, voters in Ottawa Vanier and Niagara West Glanbrook naturally have concerns. They see a Premier who defended someone under investigation for Election Act breaches out campaigning for votes. In fact, the Premier attempted to interfere in the investigation by suggesting at a February 7th press conference that we don't expect that to happen regarding charges against mm -hmm. Pat Cervera. Mm -hmm. Reports now say that she will be charged. Speaker, with these Election Act charges linked to her, does the Premier think it's appropriate for her to be involved in all of these campaigns? Well, Speaker, now the true nature of these questions come through. They're all totally partisan in nature because they are, they're all, all talking about the, the, the by-election. Speaker, the Premier is the Premier of the province. She's the leader of the Ontario Liberal Party, and she will continue to job the job that, that, uh, that has been given uh, to them. And the good people of uh, Niagara West, Glenbrook, and Ottawa Veni are going to make a decision based on the quality of candidates that is before them, uh, based on the record of this government that is to invest in our schools and in our, in our, in our hospitals, to make sure that we're investing in in public structure, be it go train to, to Niagara Speaker or the building of the LRT here, in here. Uh, Ottawa. These are the issues that what the people uh, in those ridings are, are talking about, and that is why they're going to support the Liberal candidates on those ridings, Speaker. Thank you. Ah. Your question, the member from Bromley, Gore, Malton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, yesterday I was... Member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, I was disappointed to see that neither the Premier nor the Minister appreciate the true severity and seriousness of the circumstances surrounding Mr. Adam Capé. Mr. Capé is a 23-year-old man who has been detained in solitary confinement for four years in a jail in Thunder Bay with 24-hour-a-day artificial light. A growing number of experts have referred to these conditions as meeting the definition of torture. This is extremely serious. 
But the minister made it clear that the circumstances around Mr. Kepe were specific to Mr. Kepe and unique to his cell and his circumstances. Was it also abundantly clear in the 25 reports that the minister received about Mr. Kepe that those conditions were unique to him? And if so, Question. why didn't the government act to change this? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, uh, I know the minister will want to comment, but I just, I just want to, I just want to uh, respond to the member to say. I have been very clear that this is a serious situation. I've been very clear that the status quo is not acceptable, Mr. Speaker, and that uh, that uh, what happened uh, what happened in the situation with uh, with Adam Capay is is unacceptable. But, Mr. Speaker, we have to understand what the circumstances are, which is why we have why the minister has uh, announced that we will be doing a review. That the whole issue of segregation needs to be looked at, Mr. Speaker. We've already changed we've already changed some of the rules in terms of of the, uh, the weekly review and the amount of time, Mr. Speaker, but there needs to be a full review. It's a very serious issue, Mr. Speaker. There is no one on this side of the House who would argue otherwise. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, what's also troubling is the previous minister must have also received reports about this circumstance, and he did nothing about it. Mr. Cape, like far too many people in our jails, the problem, the, the increasing problem is that he was not tried or convicted of anything. It's clear that there is a crisis in our courts, in our community, in our, in our court system, in our correctional service system, in our community release, and our bail program. Everyone can see it. It's obvious. It's something that everyone knows about. We don't need another review. We need action now. We need the government to do something now. What is this government going to do to ensure that Mr. Capay receives justice and that there are no other Adam Capays in any of our jails in this province? Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Sir, Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I uh, appreciate the question from the member opposite. Uh, this is a serious issue, as the member pointed out, and we take this issue very seriously. And uh, after becoming aware of this uh, particular issue, I immediately requested uh, that ministry officials inform me of any circumstances across the province in any of our institutions where there were these types of similarities with respect to lighting or any other conditions under which an individual is being held in segregation. Mr. Capay is in a different cell with very different conditions today. We've taken action on that, and we are obviously seized with this issue and the reliance the, the over-reliance, frankly, Speaker, on segregation in our system. It is a systematic challenge, and we are working uh, to resolve that. We've also indicated that we are committed to a full, independent, third-party review of our Answer. system so that we can make the investments that uh, we all want to see in our system. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Question. The member from Northumberland, Quinty West. Well, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. This morning, I attended an all-party co-op caucus to learn more about the cooperative movement in Ontario. As many of you know, co-ops operate across the province and engage in a variety of activities, from housing to credit unions to child care and a great deal more, Speaker. From the Aaron Theatre and Empire of Chiefs in Trent Hills to Sunshine Heights Daycare in Port Hope to Bayshore Credit Union in Quinty West, cooperatives play an important role in everyday lives of those people in Northumberland, Quinty West, and indeed across the province. Mr. Speaker, can the minister inform this House about the important and innovative role the co-ops play in the lives of citizens of Ontario? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Uh, thank you. Mr. Speaker, I want to say thank to the uh, member from Northumberland, Quinty West, and also several other members of this legislature who attended the All-Party Co-op Caucus this morning. And I also would like to thank the <coughs> other co-chairs, uh, the member from Oxford and the member from Windsor Tecumseh, Tecum for their involvement. Co-op plays a vital role across the province, especially in many small and remote communities. One example of a community that has benefited from co-op is Moonbee, a northern Ontario. The owner of the local grocery store was getting older and thinking about retiring, and he could not run the store anymore. However, he could not find a buyer for this grocery store, and instead of closing, Mr. Speaker, the community stepped up and created a co-op, and this co-op now runs the grocery store and provides a vital service to Moonbeam. Mr. Speaker, co-ops are integral to communities like Moonbeam and to our province as a whole. 
Good. Thank you. Yeah. Supplementary. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would like to thank the minister for her answer and for her continued work on this matter. As the minister noted, co-ops are incredibly important to communities across the province and have a special place in northern and rural areas. The all-party co-op breakfast showcased the wide range of co-ops from small businesses in Moonbeam to large co-ops co like Gailey Foods and Mountain Equipment Co-op. The Co-op Caucus took note of the tremendous social benefits cooperative corporations bring to their communities. Mr. Speaker, can the minister inform the House of her mandate commitment to cooperatives across Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you very much for the, the members' interest in this movement. The mandate letter I receive as Minister of Government and Consumer Services underscores our government's commitment to the cooperative sector in Ontario. In 2017, I will modernize cooperative corporation registration to help and help ensure that co-ops can grow and thrive in communities across the province. I look forward to many more co-op caucus meetings and working with my co-chairs to fulfill my mandate commitment. Furthermore, I would like to offer my most sincere congratulations to Ms. Lucy Mancion, head of a credit union in Ontario, and she, she is a new senator and is becoming our new federal partner for cooperatives. The member from Simcoe Gray. Speaker, my question is for the uh, Premier. Uh, Speaker, the Associate Chief, uh, Associate Chief Justice uh, Douglas Cunningham of Ontario Superior Co Court has written that, and I quote, appointments to government offices are not to be traded for political favour. He went on to say they are appointments that must be made in a fair, open and transparent manner. Well, Mr. Speaker, the CEO of the Ontario Liberal Party is about to be charged for trying to trade a job for political favours. So I asked the Premier. Did the Premier, when did the Premier know, or did the Premier know that Pat Sabera would be offering Andrew Olivier a job in exchange for stepping aside in the Sudbury Good bylaw? Question. Attorney General. General. Speaker, again, um, you know, the, the opposition can continue to ask the same question yeah, again. Again, the answer is not going to change, that if charges are laid, uh, these, these are the type of matters that should be dealt in the court of law. Um, and not in this legislature. So, Speaker, I'll urge the members again to uh, to focus on issues that are important to Ontarians, uh, focus on issues that ensures that their lives get better every single day. Let's focus on issues that the Premier is working on, that is to create jobs uh, for Ontarians. Uh, Speaker, uh, we as a province are, are growing. We as a province has one of the lowest uh, unemployment rates uh, in, in the country. We are making sure that, uh, that we have a robust climate change action plan. These are the kind of things, Speaker, that are important to Ontarians, and the Premier and the the government will remain focused on them. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Supplement back to the uh, Premier, Mr. Speaker. Premier, I don't think it's doing you any good to hide behind your House Leader. People of Ontario want to hear from you. Uh, the allegation is that you told Pat Sabera to allegedly bribe uh, Mr. Oliveira, uh, Olivier. I'm going to ask the member to withdraw and restate his question. Mr. Speaker, I would ask draw and then try to re-ask the question. Thank you. Well, I'll simply ask, uh, Mr. Speaker, through you, uh, who ordered Pat, Severia, uh, Pat Sobera to allegedly bribe uh, Andrew Olivier in the Sudbury? Was it you, Premier? Two, two things. Um, the the gov chief government whip is now warned. And and the second thing is, is I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. Withdraw, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Attorney General. Speaker, I'm uh, uh, speaking in this house as the Attorney General of the province, as the Crown uh, Chief Law Crown Office Officer uh, of the province. Uh, uh, speaker. Uh, to advise all members that it is our shared responsibility uh, to not engage in uh, matters that may be before uh, the courts. Uh, speaker, courts are independent bodies, uh, and we should respect their authority 
uh, to, to engage in these matters and ask the kind of questions that the opposition is asking. This is not the place to do. And that's why, Speaker, we have a subjudice rule in our standing orders exactly to, to warn us and, and advise us uh, not, to, not to engage in. Uh, speaker, the, the Premier has been, has been open to the public, uh, to the legislature, uh, and she'll remain uh, transparent, but she won't discuss things that may be before Thank the you. force. Thank you. New question. The Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last week, uh, her health minister said that Ontario's long-term care homes have the most robust oversight and accountability measures in the world. But this week, an Ottawa family is asking how their 89-year-old mother, who lives in a for-profit long-term care home, could end up with a maggot infestation in her leg wound. The family was horrified, Speaker, and I think everyone who hears of this story is going to be horrified. Ottawa police are now investigating the for-profit nursing home where she lived, and it begs the question, if Ontario has the best oversight of long-term care in the world, how could this happen to any resident in any one of our long-term care homes? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, I too was uh, horrified and disgusted when I learned of this uh, incident uh, in an Ottawa nursing home. Mr. Speaker, we we have a zero tolerance for abuse or neglect, and Mr. Speaker, immediately upon my ministry receiving a critical incident report, my ministry took immediate action. We have investigated uh, the situation in this long-term care home. Uh, we will be issuing a public report. That report will be out in the coming days, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and it is absolutely unacceptable that a resident of a long-term care home experienced this poor level of care. Yep. When my ministry was informed of the situation, as I mentioned, Mr. Speaker, last yes, month, we immediately ordered a critical incident investigation. We've worked with the home to establish a plan. I'll continue with Thank this you. supplementary. Supplementary. Speaker, last week the health minister said there's zero tolerance for abuse or neglect of long-term care residents. He said it again just now, Speaker, and that's exactly the right standard to have. So, when an 89-year-old woman is sent to hospital with a maggot-infested leg wound, it raises serious questions that need to be answered. The minister, the Ministry of Health, says that they've already inspected the home and developed a quote voluntary plan of correction. But a voluntary plan in one home will not fix the ongoing significant problems in our long-term care system in this province. I asked the Premier the same question last week. I'm going to ask her again today. When will she launch a few full review or inquiry into the oversight and staffing levels of our nursing homes in this province? Well, Mr. Speaker, as I was saying, when immediately when we were informed of this incident, we launched an investigation. We performed an inspection in the nursing home in question in Ottawa. And out of this investigation, we are working with the home to establish a plan of correction. We've established a plan of correction that strictly lays out our expectation for resident wound care. Mr. Speaker, we're taking this extremely seriously as we do all of our critical incidents. And as with all of our investigations, the 100 per cent of long-term care homes that we do oversee, that we inspect annually. As with all of our investigations, the investigation report will be publicly posted within the next month. Mr. Speaker, the safety and well-being of our seniors is my highest priority, and I work every day to ensure that that oversight is as robust as it possibly can be. We're taking this incident very seriously, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. A member from Davenport. So, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question this morning is for the Associate Minister of Education for Early Years and Child Care. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, Ontario communities continue to grow, including my riding of Davenport, and many young families are today calling Davenport home, which means the demand for affordable, accessible, flexible, and quality child care continues to grow. As a mother of two young children, I know how important it is to have safe 
quality childcare as well. And I've had the opportunity to speak with many of my constituents who are young parents and soon-to-be parents who say it can be challenging to find licensed childcare spaces. So, Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, how is the government helping Ontario Question. families with their child care needs? Thank you. Associate Minister of Education, responsible for early years in child care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the hardworking member from Davenport for the question. I know she's a strong advocate for affordable childcare in her riding. Mr. Speaker, our children deserve to get the best start in life. And our government recognizes that access to high quality, affordable, licensed childcare is extremely important. That's why we committed $120 million in the 2015 budget to create 4,000 new licensed childcare spaces in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, we want to give families the support they need. In fact, just re recently, I was pleased to announce over $30 million to build 48 new childcare rooms that will result in 821 new licensed childcare spaces across the province. This is wonderful news, Mr. <laughs> Speaker, and it sends a clear message of our commitment ahead of schedule to ensuring thank that you. families and our government gets results. Supplementary. So thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the minister for that answer, and uh, thank her as well for the great that she the great work she is doing to ensuring that our youngest and brightest do have a bright future here in Ontario. And I'm glad to know that our government has been working hard to create an additional 4,000 childcare spaces in Ontario. We know that investments in high-quality, affordable childcare have many positive effects on our province as a whole. By investing in childcare, we can help Ontario families while also reducing poverty and the gender wage gap. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud of this government's past investments in childcare and its strong future commitment to creating even more spaces. So, Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, what is the government doing to strengthen Ontario's childcare system in the long term? In the long term. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to answer the member's question. And I want you to know that I've had several conversations with the member about childcare in her riding. She is really a strong advocate for her riding. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud of the achievements we've made to strengthen the early years and childcare system. But we know there's more work to be done. We continue to build an early years and childcare system that is high quality, seamless, and meets the needs of parents and children. Starting in 2017, Mr. Speaker, Ontario will help to create an additional 100,000 new licensed childcare spaces over five years for infants, toddlers, and preschoolers. Mr. Speaker, this is an historic investment, and it is one that will completely transform the way childcare is delivered in this province. Mr. Speaker, we will double the current capacity for zero to four year olds in licensed childcare, Answer. and it will help people in their everyday lives by promoting early learning and development while helping more parents find the care they so urgently Thank need. Thank you. Question the member from Dufferin Caliber. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier and the Premier alone. On February 27, 2015, the Premier said, Pat Sabera was, quote, facing allegations she does not believe to be true. She said opposition members are, quote, unfair to individuals and to their families, no matter who they are or what party they may belong to. Toronto Star is now reporting that Pat Sabera will be charged today. Mr. Speaker, were the opposition questions about the actions of her staff still unfair? And does the Premier still believe the allegations are untrue? Thank you. Thank you. General. Well, so, Speaker, um, the matters are allegations and just that uh, until they're proven in the court of law. Um, the legislature is not that court of law, uh, Speaker, so I just advise the members again to respect the rule that exists in uh, standing orders uh, and any, any matters, if charges are led, uh, be handled in, in, in our court uh, system. Uh, speaker, the Premier has been transparent uh, and open uh, to Ontarians and to this legislature um, on this issue. Uh, speaker and Premier remain focused on job uh, that is the most important to her, that is to build Ontario up, Speaker, and we support her in that endeavour. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Supplementary. 
Speaker, these questions directly relate to the Premier's staff and her office, and she has an obligation to answer those questions. Yeah. Back to the Premier. On that same day, the Premier said, quote, Pat Sobera particularly is a seasoned professional and a woman of integrity. Reports say that Pat Sobera will be charged today for bribery. Bribery and integrity don't normally go hand in hand. Mr. Speaker, does the Premier stand by the integrity of her staff member that is being charged with bri bribery today? Well, Speaker, again, I think the Premier has made it very clear the steps of the actions she will take if, if charges are, 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 are late. Um, and we've been very clear, Speaker, uh, that if they are late, that matter should be handled and will be handled. Uh, by the court in the court of law, um, and it is our shared responsibility, Speaker, uh, under the standing orders, to respect uh, that. Mr. Chairman will, Speaker, and Youth Services, come will, to order. Speaker will continue to cooperate with that in investi independent investigation. And as I mentioned, Speaker, in the beginning of the question period, and I will restate again that if there are charges laid, the matter will be handled independently by the Public Prosecution uh, Service of, of Canada. Uh, speaker, on this side of the House and on the government side, we remain focused on our job, and that is to build Ontario. Yes, Hub, speaker, we will continue to invest in our schools and our hospitals and to create jobs for hardworking Ontarians. Thank you. Thank you. Question, the member from London West, uh, London Fanshawe. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Correctional Services. I've been asking this government to take action. Stop the clock. Second time for the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Please put your question. I've been asking this government to take action on the problems faced by Elgin Middlesex Attention Centre for years now. From overcrowding to lack of supports for correctional officers, this government has remained silent, and now one man is dead and another is in critical condition due to a drug overdose. Unfortunately, the problems at EMDC are not isolated incidents. There have been multiple overdose deaths in several institutions, most recently five overdoses in Hamilton. Minister, what does it take for this government to keep drugs from entering and killing inmates in our provincial jails? Thank you. Minister, Minister, thank, you speaker, and, uh, thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank the member uh, opposite for the question. What I can say to the member is we're the first jurisdiction in this country that is putting full body scanners in our 26 institutions. In Hamilton, one is already operational. The member is referring to overdoses there. In London, there's not one operational yet, but there will be one. And what I can say is that there were two inmates uh, that uh, were taken to hospital. One individual passed away at the hospital. Uh, the ministry takes any death in custody very seriously, and it's being investigated by the office of the uh, chief coroner as well as the police. Speaker, we are continuing to make those important investments. In fact, at the Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre, there are 72 additional staff since 2013. Mental health nurses and seven uh, full-time nurses have been hired. 24-hour nursing, 24 nursing coverage is in place, Speaker, and it is helping to improve circumstances at this Thank particular you. location. Supplementary. Speaker, since 2007, there have been eight deaths at the Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre located in London, and yet there, continue, there is a continued failure on behalf of this government to implement the recommendation of the coroner's juries, previously convened to review past deaths. My question, when is the government planning on implementing the past recommendations that have been issued by the coroner's juries? Recommendations that may have saved lives of Jamie High and prevented this latest tragedy. Thank you. Speaker, we are acting to do everything we can to ensure we reduce uh, any type of contraband entering our jails. There are instances, obviously, and the member highlights that, where that is happening. But we are also the first jurisdiction in this country, Speaker, to put full body scanners into our institutions. We have invested 
in the regional intermittent centre in London, in the members' uh, uh, area, $9.3 million, 112 beds. I was there recently for the opening speaker. That helps to significantly reduce contraband with individuals who are serving sentences on the weekend. We've added 72 staff, more nurses, 357 security cameras at this particular wow. location. Speaker, we're doing everything we can to make the investments in this Answer. area and reduce those types of incidents. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Durham. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. With our, with our government's investment of $160 billion over the next 12 years, we are going to require the proper resources to help build Ontario up. Several of these materials come from aggregate pits, such as the one in my riding of Durham. While I know that building Ontario up is important, it is also important to recognize the need for consultation with the public, especially when it comes to aggregates. Minister, can you tell us what steps the province is taking to balance the use of aggregates to build critical infrastructure in Ontario while ensuring the proper consultation has occurred? Thank you. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from Durham for his question. Good question. Aggregate resources are vital to our province's economy and are used to build our roads, hospitals, schools, and playgrounds. That's why my government's proud to have introduced Bill 39, the Aggregate Resources and Mining Modernization Act. If passed, this bill would create a modern regulatory framework that will help companies and communities to use this important resource in vital infrastructure projects. On this side of the House, we recognize the importance of listening to the people of Ontario, and that's why, if passed, this bill would improve information on aggregate operations and enhance public participation by creating clearer processes to change existing approvals for a pit or a quarry and allow for customer, uh, customized consultation Answer. plans on unique applications. Speaker, we've consulted with the people of Ontario and including provisions which will tackle the challenges we identified in this proposed legislation. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you to the Minister for her answer. It is comforting to know that our government is not only committed to ensuring people in Ontario have access to the infrastructure they deserve, but also that they are consulted during every step of the process. However, there are other concerns about the operation of aggregate pits that I was hoping the Minister could address. I often hear concerns about environmental protection and accountability when discussing aggregate pits with my constituents, especially regarding these so-called mega quarries. I am curious, if passed, how the bill, how Bill 39 will affect the need for aggregate pits and the need to protect our environment, especially Question. in my riding of Durham. Speaker, can the minister tell me what the government is doing to ensure that there is environmental accountability when operating Thank you. an aggregate pit? Uh, thank you, Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for his question, and he knows, as I do, that the 407 East extension in his riding is going to need an awful lot of uh, aggregate That's to build. Correct. So, correct. as Minister of MNRF, yeah. I've also been hearing about the concerns about the environmental impact and aggregate pits. One of the biggest concerns and in the incident which sparked our review is a mega quarry that the member mentioned. So if passed, Bill 39 will create the flexibility for our ministry to create customized consultation requirements for the applications that don't key. fit the standard size of re or requirements. This will allow us to put in place procedures to properly assess the impacts to groundwater sources when making decisions for new licenses would also require existing sites to provide information related yes, to the operation of a pit or quarry at the request of the ministry. So, Speaker, the proposed legislation shows our government's dedicated to protecting our farmland, groundwater, and our environment. Good. Thank you. Your question, the member from Leeds, Grendel. So, Speaker, my, uh, my question is to the Premier. Uh, Speaker, the Premier has dodged questions this morning by hiding behind her House Leader. Yep. The Premier's House Leader says she's heard on important things. Well, I think bribery charges against the Premier's former Deputy Chief of Staff 
and hand-picked Liberal CEO is pretty important. That's pretty important. And I feel very confident in saying Ontarians feel the same way. Yeah. Speaker, does the Premier agree these unprecedented charges are important? And if so, so, will she finally come clean and tell us her role in these bribery allegations? Let me just go back to what I said at the beginning of, uh, of question period. It, this, is, this is a very important issue, Mr. Speaker. There has been an investigation that has been ongoing. We have, uh, we have cooperated with that investigation. We will continue to do so, Mr. Speaker. I have answered questions in this legislature. I have made statements outside of the legislature, Mr. Speaker, on the substance of this issue. Uh, I said in 2015 that if charges were laid, Mr. Speaker, that uh, Pat Sarbera would step down. If charges are laid, that is, is exactly what will happen, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, and I've been very clear about that. Mr. Speaker, my focus has to be primarily on the job that I was elected to do, and that is— Never, uh, never too late to receive a warning or be named. Please finish. That is serving the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. I am focused on that, and I, I, I remain convinced, Mr. Speaker, that building this province, whether it's in infrastructure or education Answer. or health care, that that is the most important focus of this country. Yeah, yeah. You see it, please? You see it, please? We have a deferred vote on the motion to closure, a motion to second reading of Bill 7. Call in the members. This will be a five minute bill.
All members? On September the 28th, 2016, Mr. Ballard moved second reading of Bill 7, an act to amend and repeal various acts with respect to housing and planning. Mr. Potts has moved that the question be now put. All those in favour of Mr. Potts' motion, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Ms. Sandler. Ms. Sandler. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Couto. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Padre. Mr. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Pratt. Mr. Pratt. Madam Malone. Madam Malone. Ms. Dammel. Ms. Dammel. Ms. McCary. Ms. McCary. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Kowal. Ms. Kowal. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. You're recognized by the court. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidel. Mr. Fidel. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Ms. Monroe. Ms. Monroe. Mr. Europe. Mr. Europe. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nick. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Vanto. Mr. Vanto. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Monsieur Monta. Monsieur Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. The eyes are 48, the nays are 37. <laughs> the eyes being 48 and the nays being 37, I declare the motion carried. Mr. Ballard has moved second reading of Bill 7, an act to amend or repeal various acts with respect to housing and planning. Is the pleasure of the House the motion carried? I heard a no. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those opposed say nay. In my opinion, the ayes have it. Calling the members, this will be a five minute bell. Mr. Ballard has moved second reading of Bill 7, an act to amend and repeal various acts with respect to housing and planning. All those in favour, please rise one at a time to be known by the clerk.
Mr. Nack. Mr. Nack. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Ms. Sanders. Ms. Sanders. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Orizetti. Mr. Orizetti. Mr. Quad. Miss Mangat. Miss Mangat. Mr. Kraft. Mr. Kraft. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Miss Dahmer. Miss Dahmer. Miss McGarry. Miss McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Miss Jassy. Miss Jassy. Miss Albanese. Miss Albanese. Miss McMahon. Miss McMahon. Miss Nidu Harris. Miss Nidu Harris. Miss Wall. Miss Wall. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dog. Mr. Dog. Miss Hogarth. Miss Hogarth. Miss Koala. Miss Koala. Miss Molly. Miss Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milch. Mr. Milch. Mr. Cox. Mr. Cox. Mr. Ronaldo. Mr. Ronaldo. Miss Vernie. Miss Vernie. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Ms. Monroe. Ms. Monroe. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McLaren. Sorry, Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipee. Mr. Pettipee. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Bantoff. Mr. Bantoff. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller, Hamilton, East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller, Hamilton, East Stony Creek. Miss Sattler. Miss Sattler. Miss Taylor. Miss Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Miss Armstrong. Miss Armstrong. Miss Fife. Miss Fife. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. The ayes are 85, the nays are 0. The ayes being 85 and the nays being 0, I declare the motion carried. Second reading of the bill, deuxième lecture projet de loi. Shall the bill be ordered for third reading? Government House Leader. Speaker, the bill be referred to Standing Committee on Social Policy. Point of order, the Premier. Mr. Speaker, I would, oh, sorry. I would like to uh, take this opportunity to welcome Todd Decker to his new role as clerk of the House. Reserve judgment. <laughs> Hang on. I just want to see how he's going to break me in. That's all. <laughs> there are no further deferred votes. This house stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.